Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mountainside. We're going to start the morning with music, so if you would stand with us as we sing together. We are so glad that you are here today, and we're looking forward to an exciting meeting, praising the Lord together.
morning. You may be seated. Well, welcome. Welcome to Mountainside Bible Chapel this morning. Hope you uh, uh, might have a busy morning going on. Maybe you just stumbled in, but we're glad you're here. Uh, we want to say welcome. We do want to honor Mother's Day. All the mothers that are here this morning, if you would stand, we want to honor you and say thank you. And we're also got a treat for you. If I can get my helpers to come down front, right here in the front row, we've got some treats for you. Give a round of applause. We just want to say thank you. Just remain standing. We're going to get you a treat. Um, guys, maybe this is the day you, or husbands, a day you do something special for your wife, okay? Maybe you do something that she usually does. You want to honor her. Hopefully, this isn't the only day you do that. Hopefully, you do that throughout the year, but we'll turn it up a little bit this today, right? So maybe if you're cooking for her, maybe you get a little supervision from her still. I learned the difference this morning between wax paper and parchment paper, all right? Wax paper will smoke in the oven when you try to do something. Um, parchment paper will not, and that's what you're supposed to use when you're making biscuits for your wife for dessert this afternoon. So, anyways, uh, there is a difference. There's maybe a little supervision, so, but we just wanted to give you a treat this morning and say thank you and happy Mother's Day from us here at Mountainside. Um, also, uh, other ladies, you know, there's many ladies in, the, in this church and that we know of that come alongside other families and help and do many, many uh, much-needed points and uh, needs in the family. We just want to say thank you. So hopefully there's enough treats for everybody to get around here. If you didn't get one, raise your hand right quick. The little kids can find you. And kids, once you're done, you can come back right up front and turn the candies in. No, you can't keep those and take those home. So perfect. Great. Well, I just want to say thank you for the work day. People that came out yesterday to do different work around the property here. We did a lot of different uh, cleaning up, uh, some organizing, some painting, um, all kinds of things. Your dad said go to the nursery for the candy. Go to the nursery, Nathan. Nathan. And pass out to the moms in there. But I just want to say thank you for the work day, people who come out and help do all kinds of uh, jobs, much needed jobs. We had a great day, so thank you. Uh, Liz, you have an announcement about Ladies Ministries? Good morning. Um, over the past several months, the ladies' ministries team has really been contemplating, discussing, trying to figure it out how it is that we can most effectively equip and encourage ladies to really step into their calling, to figure out where the Lord is stirring and leading them specifically to be influencing lives. And as we've been discussing this, we are really excited just about how the Lord is leading us and what that's going to look like. But the first thing that we're going to do is support and encourage Joan Brees in leading the share shop. For many of us, we don't, we kind of think of the share shop as just old hat by now, right? We we know it's down there, but we allow it to kind of fall to the back of our minds and and just think of it as being a typical part of what Mountainside does at this point. But if you don't know, within the past year, Joan has really come in, taken the lead on it, and is really just reinvigorating what's happening down there. So as a way to encourage her, also as a way to connect you, our church family, directly with an opportunity to serve and love uh, the community around us, we're going to be doing a customer appreciation day. And so what that looks like is in just a few weeks on June 2nd, we are going to host a free customer appreciation luncheon for those who come regularly to the share shop. Now, a big misconception is that the share shop largely serves Bible Institute students or maybe our own mountainside family, but that's really not true. It actually, the vast majority of people coming through the share shop each week are those from the surrounding community, even traveling from Ticonderoga, Brant Lake, they come 20, 30, 45 minutes, and every few weeks they have a regular schedule that they come and that they are served, their needs are met down at the share shop, and so there's really exciting things happening down there. The Lord is already moving in lives just through the share shop. Anybody kind of in church leadership will tell you one of the key statistics or notes today at in being in a church ministry, that people aren't coming to church campuses anymore. You can't expect them to come here. You have to go to them to reach them. We've certainly seen that in other aspects of what we're doing at Mountainside. But in the share shop, 
that's different. They are coming to our campus. They are coming here and being served and met. And so we just want to jump on board with what's happening with that. Next week, Joan is going to actually share more specifically about what's been happening down there, the opportunities she's had, the opportunities we all will have to kind of plug in. But first, we wanted to bring your attention to Customer Appreciation Day. And so um, as a way to say thank you, just as a way to encourage and connect with them, like I said, we're going to be doing a free lunch. And so where you would come in is maybe donating. Maybe you can throw in a $5 bill to give towards hot dogs or um, chips and so on and so forth. Maybe you can come on down that day and serve. You can help us set up. You can help us serve lunch. Um, this is just a really tangible way to support what's happening at the share shop, but also to connect and love the community around us. So we'll be putting more details on Facebook. You'll be hearing more about this in the weeks to come, but we hope you'll be a part. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, how many of you all have been to the share shop? Raise your hand. It's a lot of us here. How many of you have told our friends about the share shop that don't maybe know about it? So tell your friends about the share shop. Share shop. It's a, a great way to, like she said, get involved with different people. Lots of people come through there. It's amazing. So it's a really neat ministry to get involved with. Um, also, Memorial Day weekend is coming up. We want to just touch base with you real quick about the yard sale. You've heard about it a little bit. Uh, that is open to you guys if you need something uh, in your own household, you need to sell, uh, you want to put up an area, see Jeff Cutting, he's going to run logistics on that, but see him, connect with him, so we can, you can come this way, you can set up a little spot, a little table, and sell some items here. That will be happening at the, the bus barn, we call it, down by the ministry center, the lower end of the property there. Um, so make sure you contact Jeff Cutting. The sooner, the better. Don't, I'm sorry, it's in the parking lot, up here, up top. Perfect. So see Jeff Cutting or my wife, and she will get you those details, because <laughs> I don't know the details. But, but anyways, just wanted to uh, say welcome this morning. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the chance to just come and worship you uh, corporately, just as a, as a body here in Screen Lake and the surrounding communities. And we just thank you for uh, just the Church of Mountainside to be able to do different things, ministries we're talking about this morning, and ways to just uh, just encourage each other, be nice and kind to uh, each other, and even uh, learn what we learn here to go and, and just talk to our friends, talk to our neighbors, and be able to uh, encourage and love and be nice to them as we have opportunities to share uh, your love. That's, that's what the love we have as a Christians, and we thank you for um, all these things, and we thank you for Pastor this morning. Uh, just pray that he would uh, just be able to uh, give us the words we need to hear this morning specifically, and we thank you for him and, and his studies there. In Jesus' name, amen. Guide me in your truth and teach me. and a grande iced Americano, please. Ah, Double shot. Ah, hey guys, how was school? Are you still in your pajamas? This is math now. Honey, do you know him? You need a bath. Tomorrow. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long.
All right. Well, thank you, moms. I tried to be mom this morning. Not real good at it. So thank you, moms, for all that you do. Uh, let's stand together and sing. something to look forward to because of what God did for us when he sent Jesus to the cross. And so this next song we like to sing is called God of Calvary.
As we continue with one final song, this one's called Forever, and it's something that we can look forward to because of what God has done. We have a reason to sing.
Let's pray together. Father, I just want to thank you for this time that we can come together as a family and just lift our voices and sing about who you are and what you've done for us to give us the opportunity to have a relationship with you. And Father, I thank you for your sacrifice. And may we live that out in each of our lives, whether it's at home with our families, at, at work with, with co-workers, at school, at the grocery store, at the park, wherever we are, may we lift you high. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And the stampede begins. I would ask you this, this morning or today and this week, if you'd be in prayer for my mom and for the doctor's uh, Just uh, no diagnosis, and there's some. Uh, there's maybe one more very challenging test to be done for us to have 
any ideas to what's going on inside her body. So we'd appreciate your prayers, just for the doctors to have wisdom, and then for us to have wisdom, depending upon what the result is uh, this week. Um, so this is kind of a decision week for, in a lot of ways for us. And so be in prayer for my dad too. And so it's a, been a challenge. My mom's been in the hospital, I th think about nine of the last 11 or 12 days. So appreciate that. Well, when I first started thinking of preaching through 1 Timothy, I thought I would take one message to do chapter 2. And it's going to, looks like it's going to be four. And so we're going to do, preach on one word um, or uh, one phrase in chapter two. And it, we uh, looked at the verse last week when we looked at prayer. First Timothy 2 8 says, I desire that men, that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. And I want to talk this morning about worship and what the Bible says about worship and. Uh, what the Bible says about worship, what worship looks like. Um, the Bible uses the word worship 183 times in the, in the Scriptures, so it's a very important, a very key place. And there are many words um, in, the, in the Greek, in the New Testament, to uh, speak of worship. There's primarily one word in the Old Testament. Um, what I have before you is not necessarily all of them, but the key ones uh, the Old Testament has the idea of uh, to, to uh, either throw a kiss or to bend forward. And the, it's important we talk about the, epitome, the etymology of words that we don't think that because these, these compound phrases are put together, that's what it means. It, it really is just a word to worship. It's to, it's to put praise or to direct glory or to give homage uh, to someone who's greater, a king or, or, of course, God. In the New Testament, there are... Uh, words that either symbolize the idea of giving worship or serving in a way that worships. But all of these words carry the idea of humbling myself or submitting oneself before God. And so worship is a response to God. Um, when other kinds of religions speak of worship, they may speak of as a way of appeasing God you know, that you worship him and then he feels honored and he's going to treat you nice. Ours is exactly the opposite. We worship God because of what he's done, because of the truths that we know about him. I have preached many times about all of life being an act of worship. And there's also a fact that there is such a thing as worship that is different. Um <laughs> We have a lot of things that we say this way. Here's, here's the challenge. If a word is used to describe everything, then it doesn't describe anything. In other words, take the word missionary. We say, be a missionary every day, um, you know, that uh, we are all missionaries. Well, then what do we call the person who goes to uh, South America with the gospel? And it's not that it's improper. It's just that we, under, we need to understand sometimes that when we talk about worship, we're talking about living our life as an act of worship, as a response to God. But there is such a thing as worship proper. You know, Paul says to Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, but Timothy was a pastor and not an evangelist. And so you would say, Timothy, we're all evangelists, but Sam Fry is an evangelist, in which I am not in a different way. I guess let's use it in a different way. When I work or you work to support your family, you are loving them even when you are doing whatever you do. But that's a different thing than loving them when you hold them and hug them and say that I love you. And so it is true we live our life as worship, but it's also true that most of the time, if not all the times that the Bible uses the word worship, it's speaking about something that we do in response to God. And so um, on the first part of our service on Sunday morning is for corporate worship, and that each of us should take time um, in our weeks to spend time before God and worshiping Him. It's not just singing songs that we like to sing. It's not that it's not like God likes the specific song. 
Um, it's that uh, we turn our hearts towards God, and music is an excellent vehicle, of course, to uh, gather all of my being and to focus on God. Uh, music, God has made us to where music immediately captures not just our mind, and our, but our emotions and our body all together. And what is happening here is 1 Timothy 2.8 is that worship is not just intellectual, that raising a holy hand is a physical act. And so worship involves my body. And John wrote that we, God desires that we worship Him in spirit and truth. In other words, it's not just truth, but it's, uh, and I don't want to go down the path of, of making spirit say more than it really says, but it's, it's not just that we know things. And uh, sometimes we think of Christianity as what we know, and we don't think of it as, as even what we do or how we act. And so it's interesting, when we talk about the body, the body, there's a lot of negative things about the body in the Scripture, but there's one verse that has a good thing to say about the body, and it's 1 Corinthians 16, 19 through 20, that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in us. And we have the Holy Spirit from God, whom you have from God. That you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And so God has, has purchased our bodies, and our bodies are to be used to glorify God. And you could preach a lot of messages on ways that we glorify God with our body. And so today, I want to talk about what the Bible says about acts of worship and, and the actions. And so let me be clear about what I'm trying to accomplish today, okay? I'm not going to say that the Bible commands you to raise your hands to pray. Though, please understand that many of the statements about what we're going to preach about are in the imperative, which is the command, it's the commands are the imperative, but the imperatives are instructions to do something. Go clean your room is an imperative. I, what I would like to see accomplished today is to help us to realize that it's not only okay to physically respond to God, but the Bible calls for it and the Bible describes it. So today, think of this message as just an invitation. Uh, to consider and experience something new. Maybe a year or two ago, somebody said to me after the service, and in a critical way, wow, so-and-so sure was worshiping, meaning that they were doing something like this and whatever, and this person was watching them and saying, well, wow, but I guess they were really worshiping. And this person is a friend, so I said to them, and it sounds like someone else wasn't worshiping, right? I mean, their mind was no more on God than anything because they were so focused on what this other person was doing. I've also heard it said many, many, many times that your response in church should be what you do in your own private time. In other words, if you raise your hand in your private time, uh, but don't raise your, don't do something in church that you don't do in your private time. Just so we're clear, that's not in the Bible. Um, the Bible is filled with overwhelming evidence to the contrary. I'll give you an example. I never pray out loud when I'm by myself. I, uh, I like to solo camp, haven't done it in a couple years, but uh, I like to go by myself, and there are times where I am completely by myself, and I have to be honest. I might even get on my knees when I'm by myself, but to pray out loud just seems weird to me. Uh, it feels weird. And I know a lot of you pray out loud all the time. Um, I always think, you know, God can read my mind. And he, so if I'm praying to him in my mind, he reads my mind. So you would never say to me, well, since you don't pray out loud on your own, you should never pray out loud in church. That would be a problem. So this message is an invitation to you to get out of your comfort zone, not to feel awkward, to begin to experience worship as described in the scriptures. I do not want this message in any way to make somebody feel guilty. I think that the, the expressions in the scripture 
are an invitation to God's people. And so we're going to think of these things as an outward expression of an inward reality. Um, I have preached a couple times on fasting. Fasting is where I say with my body what my heart is feeling. In other words, so much do I long for this that I will even, I'm starving for it and I will starve myself as an expression of my desire. And so let's begin with a simple one of bowing the head. Uh, Genesis 24, 26 says, And the man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord, and the people believed and they heard, and the Lord visited them. For some reason, my skin is not wanting to move my... There we go. And worshiped the Lord. Exodus 4, 31, And the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel... And it seen their infection, they bowed their head and worshiped. And often we say, let's bow our heads to pray. Uh, we often say, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. You know, there's not one verse in the scripture of closing our eyes. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't close your eyes. And closing our eyes uh, removes distractions. And so it's not a bad thing to do. But I remember one time being in a, in a classroom at a Christian college. And the teacher said, bow your heads and close your eyes. And I guess some guy didn't close his eyes, and the teacher got really incest and called him out and says, young man, you close your eyes. I mean, if you like, grew up like I did, I grew up thinking that it really was a very grave sin to open your eyes during prayer. Anybody else with you? And somebody would say, you didn't close your eyes for prayer. And the comeback was, how did you know? <laughs> you know, so. The next one is Silence. Um, this is not going to be what you expect. Silence is usually a bad thing in Scripture. A lot of uh, um, well, my computer just hold on a second. Just talk amongst yourself. No. The, uh, that, that has never happened to me before. The uh, lot of churches had put signs over their entryway into the sanctuary to say, the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the world be silent. And I've even seen it in bulletins. And the silence of Habakkuk 2.20 is that it is the feeling of dread because the next thing is the five... Um, curses or the five woes that are being pronounced against, against Israel. The other place we see silence is in heaven when the lamb is ready to open the scroll and what is about to happen, a judgment. And so silence often in the scripture is this idea of impending judgment and those verses would not be verses you would use for us to be silent. Uh, you know, you could be speechless before the majesty of God and of course that would be silent. But uh, um, when we think about Christianity, we would not be silent because Jesus Christ has endured our woes or our judgment. And so we stand in a place where there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus because of what God has done. And so uh, sometimes we, a verse sounds really neat and we don't look at the surrounding passages and we, we come up with something else. The next word is... Uh, bowed knee, of Solomon in 2 Chronicles 6.12, of bowing his knee um, as he comes to pray. It says, and Solomon made a bronze platform, five cubits long, five cubits wide, uh, and then he knelt on his knees in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands towards heaven. Ephesians 6, or Ephesians 3, Paul writes, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Same in Isaiah and the same in Philippians says that at the name of Jesus at the end, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Uh, I personally love the idea of, even with a group of people, of getting on our knees to pray. Um, First Baptist Church in Dallas, if you ever visit there, in their auditorium, I think they have a new auditorium now, so I might be speaking of the old auditorium. The old auditorium had kneelers. 
And what the history behind those is uh, the church was going through some very big difficulties. And Dr. Criswell heard that a Catholic church was remodeling and he bought all their kneelers and had them installed. And uh, I actually thought that was a cool part of the service that during prayer time that uh, you could get on your knees and pray. So, but uh, the idea of a bowed head or, or kneeling is this humility before the Lord. There's the falling on the face of Genesis 17, 3 and 17, when Abraham fell on his face as God is revealing to him about a son. And I know there are times when our life, we hit despair, and it's just the idea of total collapse before the Lord. Um, I one time met with uh, my, my, Wendell Kempton, who's who it was. I went to his office at ABWE and met with him, and uh, for half a day, I talked to him about what was going on in my life and my future and making some decisions, and at the end of the day, he said, let's pray, and he just fell to his face across his ottoman and just began to pray to the Lord. I'll never forget it. It was an amazing experience for me. But it has the idea of totally empty of myself. There's nothing I can offer God as I go to my face before him. Well, the next one is in keeping with our passage today, and that's lifting hands. As Psalm 63, 4 says, I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Uh, Psalm 141, let my prayer be counted as incense and the lifting up my hands as the evening sacrifice. This idea, the idea of incense, of, of uh, the picture of prayers ascending. Um, you know, some churches now actually use incense, or some of you have said to me, smoke, and said, no smoke. Well, smoke is in the Bible, I'm sorry, but uh, we haven't used smoke, but uh, it is there, and it is this picture of the ascension of prayers to the Lord. Um, in relation to that is spread hands. Nehemiah bowed and worshiped. This says, uh, Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting their hands, and then they bowed low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Very interesting picture of what we think of as worshiping a false god. But you see the children of Israel lifting their hands and then going down with their face to the ground. Psalm 143 says, I stretch out my hands to you, my soul longs for you. Now, I grew up where you weren't allowed to use your hands um, for anything in church, right? If you, this is not a Baptist church by name, but we're Baptistic. And so if you're ever going to experiment, there's actually a process by which you can begin to do this. And you can start with your hands in your pocket and just flap your elbows. <laughs> and then there's carry the TV, carry the big screen TV. Then the intermediate, my fish was this big, hold my baby, or Mustafa, Mufasa. Then if you go above the shoulders, you got the light bulbs, the goalposts with adding heartburn, and... The pointer, the hatchet, and the schoolroom. The next one comes with a warning that if you're a Baptist, don't try these. The village people, Rocky, or Touchdown. You want to see what it looks like? Hey, feel free to join us, but don't feel like you've got to join right in, okay? Start slow. we got a lot of different hand raises that we use. We actually have names for our hand raises. So I'm going to walk you through real quick, okay, what they are just to let you know. Say you're my church, music is rocking. Start slow, hands in the pockets, little elbow flap, you're fine. <laughs> Very subtle, get warmed up, get your heart rate up. When you're warmed up, start with the first one. Ready, carry the TV, carry the TV. That's our first one, very subtle. Go to big screen, big screen, a little wider. Next one's my fish was this big, my fish was this big. If you're a liar, you can go out there, that's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Jesus loves you, Grace. Next one's hold my baby, hold my baby. Got dueling light bulbs. That's our next one, dueling light bulbs. Goalpost, everybody knows goalpost. Throwing a heartburn. A lot of people like to do heartburn. 
Double heartburn, right back to go post. What's my favorite? Mufasa. Mufasa, that's my favorite. The circle of life. Tim, can you go higher? Yes, you can. You can take one hand, go a bunch of different stuff. Pointer, hatchet, schoolroom. Release the doves, give the Lord a high five. Press it out. A lot of women like to wash the window. Wash the window. And when you're comfortable there, go for the big three. Village people, Rocky, touchdown. There you go, there's your big three. You're set. Well, let's move on. Shouting. Psalm 95, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Uh, the shout joyfully, you know, we see it throughout the psalm. Psalm 98 says to shout joyfully. Psalm 100 says to make a joyful noise. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, growing up, there were two times you were allowed to talk in church, right? And all God's people said? Amen. Yeah, that, unless the guy said and all God's people said, you weren't allowed to say me. It said Bob Brown's church, <laughs> right? Because he was south of the Mason-Dixie line. <laughs> like you probably. He probably said it without being prompted in your church, right? Yeah. You're north of, uh, if you're in the north, you would never, the only other time you, if he's, once a year they would say he is risen and you could go, he's risen indeed. I just want a million dollars. I want a million dollars indeed. I mean, Jesus is raised from the grave indeed. So, anyway, let's move on. Clap your hands. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to the Lord with loud songs of joy, Psalm 47. A clapping is like more joy, like, like you've been given a thousand dollars. Now, a lot of us grew up in churches where clapping was forbidden. You know, my dates aren't exact, but then about the 80s, we started to clap like if a teen did something, right? Like if a teen played the piano or sang a solo, we'd clap for the teen very politely. And then about the 90s, we started clapping for special music. And then always you weren't sure if it was wrong. In fact, the logic was if you're clapping, you're clapping for the performance. You're puffing up the artist. So what we were allowed to do was go, amen, or mmm, right? <laughs> so somebody would play a piano and everybody would go, mmm, mmm. So, and in fact, this week, I, 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 I like to just look at articles on the internet, and written in 2004 by an, an amazing Bible scholar that you all know, and probably has, maybe has even spoken here at Mountainside, and he said, in the Bible, every place that clapping is mentioned, it's negative. Clap your hands, all you people, shout to the Lord with loud songs of joy. I, I, it, it, just, it just totally amazes me sometimes. He says, better to say an amen or praise the Lord. So, you're ready for the next one? Put on your seatbelts. Dancing. And this dancing mentioned in the scripture has nothing to do with the idea of dancing when we say dancing. In fact, the question that I get asked most by unbelievers is, why don't Baptists dance? And my answer to that is, I have no idea. And that's an honest answer. I remember when I was in third grade and the pastor had spoken against dancing and I went to school and they were doing square dancing. And I went to the teacher and said, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this. <laughs> and so the teacher called my mom and my mom didn't know if I was allowed to do it. Um, I don't really remember how it ended. I just remember how ridiculous that sounds now. Years ago, at Grace Bible Church, we were transitioning our music, and it was, it was a rough time. And uh, I went on vacation, and when I came back on Saturday, I looked at the bulletin, and one of the songs that was selected for the next day was, He Set My Feet to Dancing. And I thought, How, could, could you pick a worse, a worse song when you're going through transition, right? I mean, He 
set my feet to dancing. And I remember I called the associate pastor and said, what are you trying to do to me? I mean, uh, this is going to be rough. And he, I said, before, I, before we do anything, let me pray about it. And I started studying the scripture. Psalm 30, you turned for me my mourning into dancing. Loosen my sack, sackcloth and clothe me with gladness. Psalm 149, let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with a tambourine and lyre. Who was wrong? I actually got up and introduced the song to the congregation by saying, I almost prevented us from singing the song directly from Scripture. And so we have to be careful that we're biblical and not cultural and say, well, we, you know, we don't. Now, the prime example, I remember being taught this in grade school and junior high, the story of David and Macau. And when the, when the tabernacle was being brought into Jerusalem, after so long and after trying it the wrong way, David goes before the tabernacle dancing. But again, he's, he's, he's obviously the happy feet before the Lord as the tabernacle is coming into the city. And his wife looked out from the window and thought that he looked undignified. And she gets cursed as childless. Now, the way I was told the story goes is that David danced. Macau was offended. Therefore, we shouldn't dance. And I remember asking in seventh grade the teacher, why did Macau, was she the one punished? I mean, David wasn't punished. She was the one. Like she shouldn't have been offended. And so we have to be careful what passages we use. I think of dancing in these passages as happy feet. Um, if clapping was when, what you do when you get $1,000, dancing's what you do when you get a $1 million, right? Um, better than that, my son came back to God, my father came to Christ, my neighbor's asking questions about the gospel. It's not an ecstatic experience. It's not an out-of-a-mind experience. It's just that under the control of the Holy Spirit that we are just so excited about what God is doing that we just can't stand still. Um, I have that happen to me every football season, <laughs> right? I mean, I can scare the family half to death with my dancing, you know, over a touchdown or something like that. Um, I remember being in a motel when Kirk Gibson hit his home run when he was injured, and I was in a motel, and I screamed so loud, I thought, ooh, boy, you know, my favorite sports moment. You know, we understand it in every other arena, this idea of being excited. Um, a, a, a woman comes up to another woman and says, I'm going to have a baby. What do they do? They both kind of jump up and down. Um, and so in our life, there are all these things, except when it comes to the things of God. So that's the hardest one. Now we'll just kind of cruise out to the end. Uh, playing instruments. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but interesting, the only instrument not in the Scripture because it hadn't been invented yet is the keyboard. Uh, the word organ is used in the King James, but it would be more like a pan flute. It has, the word is actually a breath instrument. So it's interesting. Then we came to a time where you couldn't have any instrument but a piano or an organ because they were the only ones that were, that were right. A singing. I'm not going to spend much time here, any time here, 169 times. But I want to close out with a couple, a couple things that we sometimes think so wrongly about. And one is uh, uh, singing the old songs. Let me get a drink before I go to this one. Each generation is to be adding to the praise material. Why? Because God is still working. Let me just read these phrases, these statements to you, just to kind of overwhelm you. Psalm 43, put a new song in my mouth. Psalm 96, 1, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Psalm 98, 1, sing to the Lord a new song. Psalm 144, verse 9, I will sing a new song. Psalm 149, verse 1, praise the Lord, sing a, to the Lord a new song. 
Psalm 42, 10, sing to the Lord a new song. Revelation 5, 9, there's going to be new songs in heaven, and they sang a new song. And Revelation 14, 3, they were singing a new song before the throne. The Bible does not say to sing the old songs. Now, I'm not saying don't sing the old songs either. In fact, if you know anything about me, I have an old hymnal collection. I have little hymnals that ever, I've never gone pack, uh, camping or backpacking or canoeing without a hymnal in my backpack. Um, I love hymns. In fact, if I went down and sat down and started playing the piano, I would play old stuff. But if we're going to say we like old songs, then say I like old songs. Don't come up with reasons. And the worst one is that they are the foundation songs of the church. We don't have any hymns from the first 1,700 years of the church. I mean, we have like, uh, Be Thou My Vision, the words are from the 8th century, but the music was written in 1905. Uh, maybe the oldest song that we have is All Creatures of Our God and King, which was written in 1225, and it has that chant sound. Uh, the music is a kind of a chant if you sing it in your head. I'm not going to do that. Um, and so here's what I'm saying. Don't say we need to sing the old songs. The next generation is going to forget them and all that kind of stuff. Um, my children, if you ask them their favorite songs, they will, hymns will be in the top five. The church hasn't and will not forget the old songs. But don't come up with reasons. This is the problem with all of these things that I've mentioned, is we have reasons why we shouldn't clap. We have reasons why we shouldn't shout. We have reasons why we should only sing old songs and this kind of thing. And none of them are biblical. In fact, really, they're, they become anti-biblical because they're actually contrary to what the Scripture says. And then my favorite one, and forgive me for inserting this because it doesn't really go with the theme, but I just had to say it. God loves repetition. Listen to this. This is going to make your head explode. You know, when, when praise music first began and people called them 7-Eleven songs, you say the same seven words, sing the same seven words 11 times. Well, get ready for this. Revelation 4, 6, and before the throne... There was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal around the throne, and on each side of the throne, the four living creatures, full of eyes in the front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, the fourth living creature like that of an eagle. The four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. 16 words, not sung 11 times. I don't know, what are they up to now? I mean, uh, a, a billion, billion? And if they go through eternity, now stop and think about people who say we shouldn't use repetition. In fact, often when people say that to me, I'll say, well, you like hymns with choruses, right? Well, yeah, well, we sing the chorus every single time we sing the verse. How, how is that not repetition? Or the, my favorite one, Power in the Blood. There's power, power, wonder working. And then we, then the music leader, remember, you say, let's see how many powers we can get in there. And there are power, 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 power wonder working. Remember that? So, if you want to say you don't like repetition, that's okay. But don't make it a theological. That's my whole point here. Don't make theology out of things that aren't theology. We're going to deal with this again next week in a different way. We're going to talk about what it means to offend somebody as we talk about how to dress for church. <laughs> yeah. So. Christ has fulfilled all the rituals of worship. So all of the, all of the things of the tabernacle in the Old Testament taking care of Christ. He has satisfied the purchase of our salvation and our high priest sat down at the right hand of the Father. And so our worship is a response. And here's the key. The posture or these actions are an outward expression of an inward reality. It's not something I do to get myself in the mood. It's not something to be conjured up. It is to be motivated by the, by the overwhelming truth of what is being said. 
Now, here's the problem. If you're like me, you are significantly influenced by your upbringing. And that any expression of emotion in the church, except maybe crying, is wrong. And so it becomes hard. And I'll give you my own personal testimony. It was that he set my feet to dancing experience in my former church that got me to really start looking at this. And I became convinced at Grace Bible Church that God wanted me to, to do this. My back prevents me from doing this. I can't do it for very long. That's an uncomfortable position. But it's still, that's what was in my heart. And then we came here, and it was put on the brakes again. Um, and uh, just getting back to that. It's very tough for us that grew up being told something is wrong to then begin to experience it. I'm going to tell you an experience that I had once. Down in New Jersey, there is a very large um, African-American church. Um, Tony Evans was part of discipling the pastor and then was instrumental in planning it. A very wonderful ministry. And so while my family was on vacation at our campground in New Jersey, I got the idea with my, that I wanted to go to the church. And Part of my family thought it sounded like a good idea, and part of my family didn't, because we had a choice between a two-hour service and a two-and-a-half-hour service. And I wanted to go to the two-and-a-half because I don't want to miss anything. Aren't you glad you weren't my kid? I didn't make my kids go. Two of them went, and one of them didn't. It was the most incredible experience I have ever had in a church service. Now, the preaching was a different experience. But I'm going to tell you something that happened in that service that was pretty amazing. It was part of the plan, but one of the pastors walked up and in a very low and sad tone, he talked about the challenges of his week. And he made the statement something like this, it's been a tough week, but God is working. And, you know, he then said something about God is still on the throne, and I'm still going to praise him. And then he said it again, you know, like two amens. And then he said it again, but this time he goes, and God is still on the throne, and I'm going to praise him. And then people stood up and started clapping. And it went on and on, and all of a sudden the organ starts up, and the, and the instruments start up, and the choir starts stands up and starts singing, and by the time we were done, it gives me chill bumps even now thinking about it. The whole place was standing and cheering and singing that we all had a terrible week, but God is still on the throne, and we're going to praise him. How amazing. I don't think it would work in our church. I'm not going to try it, at least. Um, but I just want to end by looking quickly, very quickly, at one psalm, Psalm 150. You want to take your Bibles, and uh, okay, uh, Jason Skeffington just sent me a message. We're roughly over 29 trillion repetitions of holy, holy, based on the creationist time estimate and time to speak it. Now, I had planned to go back to my office and do that, but now I don't have to. We think alike, Jason, wherever you are. Oh, there you are. That, see, now that takes the place. Remember the old churches, they used to have that phone up there for the pastor, like, hey, what's the score of the game? No, they never said that. <laughs> so I just wonder, what in the world is there to talk about? <laughs> Psalm 150, verses 1 and 2, a reason to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. What does worship look like? Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and with the harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. That would be like a pan flute. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Where was that psalm when I was growing up? And how would it have been preached? You know, that's a happy place. 
that's exciting. That's where it'd be a hard time to sit still from the way that that, that, that sounds. And it doesn't have to be contemporary music. I remember church we attended in Chattanooga was very like gospel music. But, man, when the music stopped, you could not sit still. It was so engaging. And so it, it's just the fact that God's people become engaged in what they're experiencing and what they're hearing and what they're thinking and what they're saying. That's the invitation of the Scriptures for us. God invites us to express our heart to him through the bowing of the head, through bowing of the knee, falling on the face, lifting our hands, spreading our hands, shouting, clapping, dancing, playing instruments, and singing. Let's pray. Father, you, uh, you created us in your image, and obviously um, you have given and poured into us a, a, a longing to express our joy outwardly. We can't sit still at good news. And there's no greater news in all the world than the news of the gospel, than the truths of eternity, than the truths of how great you are. God, I just pray that over the coming weeks and months that you just might encourage us to be, at least just to be a little more free for those that maybe long to in some ways express themselves and are nervous about it, that you invite us to do that. And as God, we just thank you for your word that guides us into all truth. Where, where would we be without the word? Just a lot of opinions. So may we be a people of the book. May you be honored and glorified by our hearts as we worship. In Jesus' name, amen. So not really sure how to follow that, Pastor. <laughs> I, I was raised in the same upbringing that you had, um, but if you stand with us, we're, we're going to join the angels this morning. Now, I don't know if Pastor and Deb have been planning all this, but we're going to sing Revelation song, so we're going to sing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. But let this be a time where you put aside the circumstances in your life and focus on the one who gives us breath and gives us a reason to live because forevermore we will stand in his presence and sing his praises.
feel uncomfortable in this world to uh, express yourself as we study the scripture, but you will in the next, I promise. Yeah. And so, uh, happy Mother's Day. Have a wonderful day today, all of you. Go in love. <laughs>